Behind the Brand takes an inside look at the people that are making things happen. From up and coming entrepreneurs to the big guys, we show you how they go about their business. Meet the innovators with the know-how and vision to succeed. Get behind the brand. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott here with special guest Seth Godin. Hi, Brian. Thanks for coming again. Good to see you. It's my pleasure. So uh, we're back in sunny Orange County, and uh, really great to have you. I, I wanted to know, after you've written this new book, uh, how did you get this job? You talk <laughs> how did this all happen? You know, it's funny. I think that there's an, a long tradition of people having jobs. I think that tradition is over. I, I think the model of walking up the corporate ladder is busted. And this notion that you have a job doesn't really make a lot of sense. I mean, if you work on the candy assembly line, putting truffles in the box, truffles in the box, that's a job. Yeah. But if you have almost any white collar job, almost any job where you get access to the internet, almost any job where there isn't a list of what you do all day, you don't really have a job. You have an opportunity. And I've viewed my life for 25 years as just one more opportunity to poke the box, to try something out, to do a project. I think we live in project world. And there's lots of ways people can get a job like mine, mm -hmm. it just means sticking with it for a long time before it starts to work. But you didn't always do this. You sort of started uh, on, on the corporate side and, and evolved into other things, right? You tried a lot of things. You talk in your books about some of your successes and some of your failures, and that's sort of part of the process, right? Sure. I mean, the, the number, I've failed way more times than I've succeeded. What are some of your failures? Well, I invented the first uh, videotaped aquarium and videotaped uh, fireplace. So you nice. could put a VHS tape in, and if you're really lonely and a loser, you yeah. could watch the fish go back and forth. That was before they had the one that would play on your computer. That right, exactly. Always ahead of your time. Let me just say that. Always <laughs> ahead of my time. And, and so what happened was I went to American Airlines magazine, and I said, let me run a full-page ad. And if it sells, I'll pay you for everyone that sells. And if it doesn't, I won't pay anything. Yeah. And I ran the ad, and I had set in my mind a list of 30 orders. If I got 30 orders, I'd make the tape. Yep. And I got 24 orders. Throw in the towel, send everyone a nice gift, send them the money back. Right. And a week later, I got eight more orders. Oh. <laughs> and then I had to send those back. And, then, and, you know, that's a failure. And I launched books that failed. I did uh, a book called Email Addresses of the Rich and Famous. And Roger Ebert got really mad at me. And, right, right, right. and uh, I made videotapes that didn't work and books that didn't work. My lesson was, if I fail more than you do, I win. Because built into that lesson is this notion that you get to keep playing. If you get to keep playing, that means you get to keep failing. And sooner or later, you're going to make it succeed. The people who lose are either the ones who don't fail at all and get right. stuck, or the ones who fail so big, they don't get to play again. Right. You talk about in uh, the new book, Poke the Box, I uh, will get to that in a minute, about this calculation of you know, the risk being more expensive than the opportunity, right? Right. So you know, if, if, if you're talking to a, a pacemaker assemblyman or an airline pilot, they don't try stuff. They don't say, I wonder what happens if I do this. Right. And we're really glad that they yeah. don't do that because the cost of failing is greater than the cost of discovering what works and what doesn't. Right. But almost no one I know builds pacemakers, and I don't know any airline pilots. Most of us now live in a world where the kind of failure I'm talking about isn't fatal at all. Right. That if you post a blog post and it doesn't resonate with people, Post another one tomorrow. Yeah. If you tweet something and no one retweets it, tweet again in an hour. That if you're just obsessed with always doing what everyone else is doing because you're afraid of someone saying, you failed, then you're in really big trouble. Right. A lot of people watching this are small business owners, they're entrepreneurs, or they're working for the man and they've got something in the back of their mind that they want to try. What's your message to them about jumping out there, taking a risk? Well, I think we got to first decide uh, about definitions here. A freelancer is someone who gets paid for working, right? That uh, a graphic designer might be a freelancer. That means the more you work, the more you get paid. An entrepreneur gets paid while they sleep. They build a business bigger than themselves, and she gets paid even when she's not there. And she uses someone else's money to get big. When freelancers act like entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs act like freelancers, chaos ensues. It's not a good idea. Yeah. And if you have a job with a boss, you need to think about whether your boss is asking you to do a set of tasks. Because if, if your boss is, they're going to try to find someone cheaper than you to do them, which is not good. Right. Or is your boss asking you to solve interesting problems? 
And if that's the case, now you have your work cut out for you. So what I would say to people in all three categories is take appropriate risks. And by appropriate risks, I mean risks that keep you in the game even if you fail. Figuring out how you can be in an industry or how you can be in a space or how you can try things out. You know, here's a simple example that has nothing to do with starting a new business. Let's say you always have a look, an appearance, and a shtick when you're at cocktail parties. Well, go buy a ticket to some charity gala where you don't know anyone. Wear a completely different outfit. Try a completely different shtick and see what happens. Yeah, there's no risk in that, right? Right. What's the worst that'll happen? You're not going to end up in the newspaper. Right. And you're going to discover, oh, when I look people in the eye, they're nicer to me. And I was afraid to do that in my hometown, but I discovered it here, and now I can go try it over there. It's like public speaking. No one ever died given a speech, but so many people are afraid of it. What's the downside? Right. right? And yet the people who tend to do it often discover things about themselves. You've already touched on so many little mini topics I'd like to dive deeper into. So going back to your new book, Poke the Box, explain to us what Poke the Box means, and, and then I want to talk to you about the cover. Okay. Well, it's a permission slip. What the book is, is hopefully someone will give it to you. And if they do, they are saying to you, it's okay with me for you to fail. It's okay with me for you to figure out what works. And the expression poke the box is one that programmers use. And it's, that's how you learn to program. You try something, and you see what the computer does. You try something, and you see what the computer does. Programmers don't get bummed out when their code doesn't run. They right. just make a change, and they do it again. So it's all about exploring and trying new things. Exactly. And this might work. And Similar to maybe a chef might try a different recipe and right. different ingredients to see. So why a book? I mean, the book's only 85 pages long. And, and the purpose of the book is books have impact. They have more impact than YouTube videos. They have more impact than you know a, a five-minute podcast. Yeah. That what a book does is it hits you over the head again and again, and then you can leave it on the shelf or leave it on the desk, and it reminds you that it's okay to do these things. Yeah. And you can pass it on. And you can pass it on. So our book comes in a five-pack. It comes in a 52-pack because... I'm hoping some people will read it and go, everyone in my company needs to read this. They can buy 52 of them in a right. clever box and leave it on the reception desk. You can fit in your back pocket. It's small enough. There you go. Tell me about the cover. So uh, I don't think I can remember a book that didn't have any words on the front. It's just a... Bingo. We invented it. It's an that. icon. Right. So it, it, not only is this my next book, I've in, invented a whole publishing company. Yeah. I try to take my own advice. And my advice here is poke the box. So I'm poking not by going back to my old publisher and taking a bunch of money, which would be easy, but to say, what if I reinvented publishing altogether? And so our back end is powered by Amazon. We're the first publishing company to be able to do that. And it gives us all sorts of cool advantages. But one of them is that anytime you see a book for sale online, there's the cover. And right next to it is what it is. So why do I need to say what it is when right next to it it's going to say what it is? Right. Even better if it's on your desk. And someone walks in and they see a book with no writing on the cover, what are they going to do? Yeah, I'm curious, right? Yeah, and so you have a whole conversation that I didn't pay for just because I gave you a beautiful cover with no words on it. I, I'm seeing the master plan. This is really a metaphor about curiosity, right? Yeah. Because there's a theme that runs throughout the book. Tell us about how important it is to be curious and maybe talking about some of the things that are missing that you see you know, business owners and people sure. that are trying to get discovered and become indispensable. Well, there's a company called Penguin Magic, and I, and I love their business model, and I, we don't have time for me to get into it, but their website is filled with uh, videos of people doing their tricks, but yeah. they're not doing them in a tuxedo with a white rabbit. They go into the streets of Las Vegas, find semi-drunken tourists, right. and do tricks on them right there on the street, right. usually at night. And the tricks are pretty amazing, and inevitably, the people start screaming, oh my God, it's Satan, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And then they go, how'd you do that? Yeah. And they all want to know how you did it. And the sure. way Penguin makes a living is people buy the trick to find out how it's done, right? Gotcha. Too often in our world, someone does something, something extraordinary, and we don't say, how'd you do that? We don't wonder, how's it work? How did, how did that business get from here to there? How did that thing, what's the technology behind that? It's, it's like magic, but we don't care. Yeah. And if you're not curious, you're not going to learn. And so, in the old days, that was fine because the world was the same. But now the world is so different, you have to learn. So how did we get there? I mean, is it we're desensitized? Is there too much out there that we're just spoiled? You know, we have all this technology basically at our fingertips. We don't have to walk very far to get it. Um, most of it's free. Why, why aren't we curious anymore? Well, we, you know, we've been brainwashed. The, uh, when they electrified America, they only had uh, one outlet in the house, and it was a, a thing with a light bulb in it. Yeah. They hadn't invented any appliances. So when they invented the, the dishwasher and the washing machine, washing mach the clothes washer was first. Yeah. And 
you had to unscrew the lights in your house so it was dark. And you had to screw in the thing to bring the electricity. To, and it was inevitable that you would figure out how it worked because if you didn't, it was going to electrocute you. Sure. Right? And once we got over that hump by the 1940s, businesses worked, electricity worked, cars worked, the system worked. And then school got to work brainwashing us to just accept it all. Right. Don't ask questions. No user serviceable parts inside. Right? You shouldn't own a screwdriver anymore. Don't open this. Sure. And so that thing compounded by you know, big banks and big corporations and big government agencies saying, don't ask. Just listen. Yeah, conform. Right. So now we enter this revolutionary age that we're in right now where so many things are being rebuilt. And every once in a while, a 20-year-old comes along and builds a website that makes them a billion dollars. And the rest of us were just sitting there, oh, we never thought of that. Yeah. Because we're just waiting for someone to tell us what to do. Talk to me about the resistance. Um, in Lynchpin, a uh, fantastic book, very personal. You had said, we talked about this last time, very personal for me too. And it was a very timely message, I think still very relevant today and probably five years from now. But talk to us about the resistance, about fear, and how all that plays and how we can use it to our advantage. Yeah, well, how did we end up accepting this dictatorship of the system? How does it work in other countries? How does it become the status quo? It turns out we are evolutionarily organized to do that. There's a part of our brain right here called the amygdala, just above the brain stem. It's the part of the brain that's been around for millions of years, the same brain a chicken has, the same brain a lizard has. Psychologists call it the lizard brain. And if certain things happen, turbulence, your boss's caller ID on your cell phone, mm -hmm. right? Certain uh, siren in your rear view m mirror, it instantly activates. Right. And it doesn't matter if you were in the middle of something great when it happened, all other systems shut down. And so what we do in school is in order to get a kid through 12 years of it, the teachers discover the shortest shortcut is just activate that. Every time you activate that, the kid will become compliant. So we set up this system and then we hire people and we say, you know, do this or you're fired. Right. And in our head we say, Fired, no job. I'll never get another job. I'll run out of unemployment. I'll become homeless. I'll die. So they, the boss says something, and we immediately associate that with dying. And so this brainwashing system was in place for a really long time. And it's, you, you can come to power and become a dictator with it. You can also become a boss or a teacher or a parent using that system, yeah. which is all great unless a revolution comes. And when the revolution comes, the people who can figure out how to shut down their amygdala long enough are able to succeed. And so that's why Silicon Valley works, because everyone is sitting around reassuring themselves that they should be calm, where everyone else in the world is freaking out. They're going, oh, let's build something new here. Well, yeah, and, and the, the problem is that we've been punished so much for trying new things, right, that we've been conditioned not to do it, right? Right, and then we start punishing ourselves, and that's what I'm talking about. Right now, you're actually not being punished that much to try new things. Right. Right now, it's easier to start a business today than any time in history. The only person who's stopping you from starting a business is you, right. right? Access to technology, access to capital, access to information, access to markets, never, ever been like this before, right? When I started early companies of mine where I needed 70 people to build a company and yeah. raise millions of dollars, now you can start, you know, the Domino Project I started with zero. Squidoo, we started with zero. I mean, yeah. it's not hard anymore except the voice in your head, the resistance, as Steve Pressfield calls it. I love that you say there's thousands of books, maybe millions of books that talk to us about what to do and we can go to, you know, graduate school and learn what to do, but what's missing is how to do it or actually to go. Talk about just that piece, initiative. Well, the first thing to say about initiative is uh, no one gives you initiative, you have to take it, which is really cool. Most people don't think about it that way, but it's true. I taught a uh, at the NYU School of Business Graduate School. I had the most popular course in the school. And there were 60 people in the class, no grades. I mean, sorry, no tests, no homework. 100% class participation. Yeah. And one of the classes I come in and I said, everyone bring a cell phone. And I called people up one at a time and I gave them a phone number of someone and I said, call this person and sell them a subscription to Time Magazine <laughs> while everyone in the class watches you. Now, tell me exactly what the downside is here. They'll hang up on you. Yeah. Right? That's the, but if you don't call, I'm going to give you an F. Right. One third of the class wouldn't make the call. Really? Because it, the, the act of having to talk extemporaneously to a stranger in front of the class was so overwhelming to people who had never, 
ever been asked to take initiative, hmm. that they just shut down. I mean, the way you get to the second year at the Stern School of Business is you get A's from the time you're in third grade. Yeah. And the way you get A's is you just say, what are the instructions? What does this do? What do you need me to follow? Yeah, exactly. conformity. Yeah. How does this idea, I'm just curious, because I spent some time working in Japan. There, there's a country that is all about conformity yeah. for a good reason, right? Geography demands it, right? They all have to live close quarters and you know, it's busy and so it's part of, it's ingrained in their culture. Does this work in other places? Yeah, you see, let's compare Singapore and Japan. Japan's in real trouble, right? Japan's in trouble because the conformity thing isn't working. It didn't work at Sony and it doesn't work internally for a lot of companies because yeah. if all you're going to do is what you did before and th there isn't a, you know, a Deming or somebody else with a new map, right. it's really tough. Singapore is just as crowded as Japan, but Singapore the government there says, you know, we're not going to give you a lot of other freedoms, but we're going to give you the freedom and we're going to insist that you guys go poke. You go figure out how to fail at this business and this business and this business, and that's what they built the country for. Right. So I think that, yeah, all around the world, what, what they figured out in China is they're saying, we don't want to be the low-cost producer of other people's junk. That's not where we're going to end up. So they keep trying to move up, and so they're inventing stuff, whether it's solar power or new ways to make cars, et cetera, that isn't about waiting for someone in the United States to fax in the plans. Right. And so we're losing that because we're lulling ourselves into believing that we're the only people in the world who know how to take initiative, when in fact we're learning that we, all we know how to do is watch the Super Bowl. That works, especially in Sin Singapore, when the higher-ups are giving you permission. Right. So I guess my question is, if you're at the bottom of the totem pole, uh, and then we have folks at the top of the totem pole who may be you know, the roadblocks, who should we go after first to convince? I mean, is it really just about us? Is it the, you know, be the change you want to see in the world, whether you're at the top or the well, bottom? Well, see, the whole my boss won't let me thing is a problem. And I, I start with this. Uh, if you're saying that if you go to your boss and say, may I do blah, 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 that your boss says no. Well, of course she says no. She says no because what you're really saying is if I do this and it fails, it'll be your fault. Right. And if it succeeds, I get the credit. Okay? Yeah. No boss will do that. Yeah. So this, that's a crutch. And it could be the HR department, too, saying, you know, you've got to write with pens that only have blue ink or whatever. They might, but that's the second part. If you truly work in an organization that will not let you take even a little initiative, you ought to try to get fired. Because, first of all, I don't think you really work in an organization like that. Right. But if you do, why are you wasting today and tomorrow and the next month and yeah. the next six months doing that? Oh, maybe it's, and I've talked to a lot of people about this, maybe it's just in our minds. It maybe is, it's that's resistance. where it is. Yeah. That's exactly what it we is. We feel stuck. So, for, you know, for example, when I worked at, at my only real job at Spinnaker Software, you know, it was a real company back in the day when there were real companies with real jobs. But I did things like on Christmas Day when most of the people who were buying educational computer games were opening their educational computer games, I came in and answered the phones instead of having no one answer the phone. Because right. it was fun. Three hours of like helping kids on Christmas morning, talking to them, blah, blah, blah. Well, was someone going to fire me for doing that? Was I in any company? Can you imagine getting fired for doing that? So two weeks later, when you're at a meeting and someone's talking about rewriting the manual, you can say, well, when I was answering the phones <laughs> and I talked to 200 people, everyone in the room sits there quietly because you're now the expert. Right. Why are you the expert? Because you figured out what to say when you answered the phone, and you're the only person in the room at your level who's ever talked to a customer, and you've talked to 200 of them. What does that cost? Yeah. Right? And so the point is that we all have so many more degrees of freedom than we give ourselves credit for. Even if you're a waitress at Denny's, you can figure out how to be the waitress they will miss if you're gone. Yeah. And if, you know, the, the napkins are out of place or, you know, you think we should have shinier spoons, you can take care of that. Yeah. It's, it is about picking yourself. Right. And, yeah. you know, every once in a while you hear the case of, you know, some waitress who got a $10,000 tip because some guy had come in so often. Yeah. And, you know, finally he said, thank you. Yeah. Right. Now, she's not doing it for the $10,000 tip. She's doing it because discovering how to smile differently or talk differently to make the patron have an engagement with you. That's your real job. Your job is not to bring the eggs from one place in the restaurant to the other. They can do that themselves at a buffet. They're coming because you are a human being, and what human beings do is art, is new stuff, is connection. And this humanity right. is what has been boiled out of us, and what we're seeing is it's coming back in. Right? I, I, there's this phrase that's been ringing around my head all day today, which is, you know, Tom Peters wrote a magazine story years ago called The Brand Called You. That was brilliant. Um, and it totally changed the way people thought of branding. Mm -hmm. 
But my new thing is I'm not a brand. You are not a brand. You're a person. And there's a big difference between being, you know, Dell right. and being Michael Dell. Right. And I think that we're now entering this world where it's okay to be a person again. Excellent. Seth, as always, thank you so much for being here with us. Appreciate you coming here and great talking with you always. Well, I just want to say I think the community needs to recognize the fact that you're out there poking every day, that you're not sitting there following a map. It's all about how you can connect with people, how you can bring them up. And, and I think that there's not enough of that in the world, so I thank you for doing it. My pleasure. Thank you so much.